ye saints of the Lord, he is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Good morning, and welcome to worship at Mount Zion United Methodist Church and Scottsville United Methodist Church. We are very happy to have you with us this morning. And if you're on Facebook, would you please leave a comment so that we know you're out there. I have a special shout out this morning to Ms. Agnes Johnson. She had surgery this week for a broken hip and Agnes, we miss you, we love you and hope that you are back on your feet really soon. Now let's center our hearts for worship. Good morning, children of God. I invite you to listen to these words calling us to worship this day. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Our opening hymn this morning is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. In silence, let us continue to offer our prayers to our loving God.
Amen. The first scripture lesson this morning is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, go lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up, went to Eli, and said, Here I am. For you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Our Gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. Listen for the word of the Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, just as you called Philip and Nathaniel, and just as you also called out to Samuel, we need to hear your voice calling out to us this morning. So I pray that by a miracle of your grace, you'll transform these human words of mine into your living word, speaking to us and reaching us exactly at our point of need. I pray in the strong name of Jesus, our risen and reigning Christ. Amen. Today's scripture lesson tells the stories of three individuals called by God to service. We see three very different responses, but we see one thing in common. 
Each of them had to be listening for the call. Two of the calls came to people from Jesus directly during the beginning of his earthly ministry. One call story is short and sweet. Jesus found Philip and said to him, follow me. And Philip did just that. In a second call story, we see Jesus using a different, more indirect approach. Nathaniel already had heard from his brother Philip about this teacher from Galilee, and Nathaniel already was skeptical. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus had to break through that layer of skepticism. Instead of simply calling Nathaniel to follow him, Jesus had to demonstrate first to Nathaniel that Jesus knew him, knew the person inside that hardened exterior. The discussion about having seen Nathaniel under the fig tree wasn't just small talk or a conversation starter. It was a way of saying to Nathaniel that he was a person that mattered. It worked. Nathaniel made his profession of faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and Jesus told him that he had not seen anything yet. The third call story that we've heard this morning, it's actually the first one chronologically, was God's call to Samuel. The scriptures refer to Samuel as a boy. We don't really know his age at the time. He was old enough that his parents had surrendered his custody to Eli in the temple, and Samuel had started to perform some of the priestly functions in the temple. But he was still young enough that at the end of chapter 3, we see these words, As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. Samuel still had not learned to discern the voice of the Lord, and it took three times of God calling his name, plus some additional coaching from Eli for Samuel to recognize the voice of God. But he finally got it. He finally heard the voice of God and, as instructed, said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Three different individuals, three different occasions, three different ways of calling, three different ways of listening, and three different ways of responding. I'm thankful that all three of these responded and accepted God's call on their lives. But you notice that in each case, these persons had to be still enough to hear God's call. And they even had to be willing to let go of their own prejudices, filters, and expectations in order to even hear the voice of the Lord. There is a time for stillness. True, there is a time for action, but there is a time for listening. The writer of Ecclesiastes tells us that there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. But I fear that in our day, we confuse silence with not speaking. I suspect that I'm not the only one who has spent too much time in the past week listening to the cacophony of news reports about the events in our world. We listen to our favored sources of news, often the ones that agree with us or have even shaped our opinions, until we've absorbed so much of their opinions that we confuse them as our own. And then we share them with others and add to the noise. We let them echo in the chambers of our soul so that we can hear only them and not the voice of the Lord. And then we get anxious. It doesn't matter your party politics or who you voted for. It's just so easy to get caught up in the events around us. We can relate so well to the psalmist who wrote, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? I believe that God is calling me this week to a week, and maybe longer, but a week of stillness. Not stillness as in inaction, 
but stillness as in stillness of heart, stillness of listening to God. I think of the example that Jesus set for us when he and his disciples went out on the boat and this huge storm came up. The disciples were in a panic. They feared for their very lives, but Jesus fell asleep on a cushion in the stern of the boat. When he was awakened, Jesus looked at them and asked, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And I think of Paul's words to the Philippians, written near the end of his earthly journey. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then there are other words of Jesus, spoken near the end of his ministry and recorded by John, when Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then later on, he said, In the world you face persecution. But take courage. I have conquered the world. But I'll be the first to admit to you that sometimes... Finding this peace in the center of our hearts is easier said than done. I won't claim to be an expert in this or to have all the answers, but I'd like to share a few suggestions that might seem simplistic, but they just might help you get through the next week or two. They might even help you in the rest of your life's journey to cultivate peace. First, turn down the noise. The noise in our lives is addicting. It's all around us, amplified by our own radios and televisions, our iPads and computers. How can we ever think we will hear the voice of God if we drown God's voice out with everything else? Turn down the noise. Second, Cultivate a silence of peace. Now, silence is not the same thing as the absence of noise because some silence can even be disturbing. Do you remember that old Simon and Garfunkel song singing about people talking without speaking in the sounds of silence? The silence that we cultivate is the silence where God can speak just as Elijah heard the voice of God speaking in a sound of sheer silence. Cultivate a silence of peace. Third, take a walk. Take a walk and take a good deep breath outdoors. Get outside, absorb the beauty of God's world. Feel the breeze, touch the earth, get in touch with the God who walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. Take a walk. Suggestion number four, double check the voices you'd hear. Samuel actually checked twice with Eli to find out if Eli had called him. Nathaniel had to hear for himself the voice of the Lord to find out if something or someone good could come from Nazareth. If you think that you are hearing the voice of the Lord, you may want to sit with it a day or two or even longer if necessary. Is the word you hear from the Lord consistent with the message of the gospel? Does the word you believe to be from the Lord bring you peace? Not necessarily an affirmation of what you want, but the peace that passes all understanding. If not, you may need to keep on listening. Suggestion number five, say yes to God. When you have discerned that the invitation you hear is truly from God, be prepared to say yes. Don't struggle with it. 
You may have to continually check this, re-examine your heart to make sure you are hearing from God rather than yourself, and be prepared to make course changes, but be assured that when you have truly discovered the will of God, even when God asks you to go outside your comfort zone, that saying yes to God will bring you peace. Suggestion number six, love someone. I'm finding that the call I receive from the Lord usually is to love someone, to build them up, to help them experience God's love. There may be times that we are called to confront, to educate, or to correct. But I find that more often than that, not those are my desires and not coming from God. But even in those times that we are called to correct someone, we're told to speak the truth in love. There's such a fine line between speaking God's truth and imposing my own opinion. I find it much more useful to offer a word of love and encouragement than a word of correction. So I'm trying to remember not to try to change people's minds, but to love their hearts and let that work of transformation remain God's work. This week, there will be much to distract us, to try to pull us down, but we have many opportunities coming to us to demonstrate God's love and God's peace to a world in need. I feel the invitation from God to share his love. So let me close by affirming to you that God loves you and claims you as his child. And I believe that God is inviting us, you and me, to offer words of love and actions of peace in this world. So listen in the silence. Listen for the voice of God. How will you respond? Will you say, here I am, Lord. Speak, for your servant is listening. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them, who shall I send? Here I am. Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if 
God, we want to be your people. We want to be instruments of your peace. But the truth is, sometimes we don't feel very peaceful, and we need your touch of grace to bring us peace. We need to see with your eyes in order to see people around us as you see them. We need to be filled with your presence to enable us to love as you love and as you call us to love. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. We pray for healing in our nation, for healing the divisions among us. Give us, I pray, the vision to see that it is in giving that we receive. It is in forgiving that we are forgiven. And in our giving and in our forgiving, help us to see you in each person we meet. Lord, we pray for a peaceful transfer of power in our nation this week. And I pray that in the weeks, months, and years to come, we will continue to set an example to the world of what peace can mean in our nation. We pray for the healing of our world, healing from this coronavirus pandemic, the loss of two million lives in our world, and. 400,000 lives in our nation, it just staggers the mind. Lord, deliver us from this pandemic. Please heal those who are suffering. Strengthen the hearts and souls of those who provide medical care. Guide those who are seeking new vaccines and new ways of treatment. Lord, heal us. Lord, we pray for the people who are on our hearts this day. For Agnes Johnson, recovering from hip surgery. For John Smith and his mother, Katie. For T. White, the family of Lucille Wright. We give thanks for Tilly Adcock and Connie Knight and her son, Derek, and their recovery from COVID but we offer additional prayers for Connie who fell and dislocated her shoulder. We also offer prayers for Francis Johnson, Ron Moore, Bev Butler, Bob Srigley, Carter Conrad, Dan Dowdy, Grady Lassiter, Eileen Piller, Margaret Hughes, and those we now name in our hearts.
May those who are suffering find healing and relief from pain. May those who are grieving find comfort. May those who are anxious find peace. And may all of us find awareness of your presence in our hearts and lives. We pray with confidence in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, O Jesus, I have promised. together. Hear these words of benediction. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen.
go in peace.